put it now. Okay. How do you? This thing work? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It is on, ostensibly. Is this on? The gavel. Yeah, the gavel works. Hello, can I be heard in the back of the room? This, okay, I can't tell if this is on. Uh, thank you. Let me call the meeting of the uh, Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors for Wednesday, September 21st, 2022, to order. My name is Kevin Flynn, and I'm chairing this year. Welcome back in person, everybody. Uh, before we take roll, I wanted to uh, just acknowledge that we have a new member uh, who is attending tonight, and that is uh, Mr. Brian Welch uh, from RTD, who is taking a seat once occupied by the estimable uh, Bill Van Meter. Uh, I used to work with both of these gentlemen when I was at RTD. Welcome, Brian. Um, Uh, I have been told to make these additional announcements uh, because we're not on Zoom anymore and we can't mute ourselves. Uh, please keep side conversations to a minimum so folks can hear the discussions. The new cameras, I guess that's these things, they call them owls, do they? Uh, these new cameras pick up everything, including your whispers. <laughs> so please be quiet. Uh, how to use the new table, the uh, table mics. For those of you who haven't used these before, when your microphone touch the microphone and it will be activated and it eventually will kick in about five seconds after you start talking. And then when you're finished talking, touch it again so that it doesn't pick up anything you might be saying that you don't want to be heard except by the owl. Uh, if we have any alternates here, I don't know that, but are there any alternates here attending for their member, the director? We have one, two, three. Okay, uh, because if your director is here, if the director from your jurisdiction is here, uh, they are the ones who are seated and alternates would be in, in the back, but you're all here in play, in, uh, acting for your your director. Thank you. I think those are all the announcements, and now we can take roll. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Bill Holland of Arapahoe County. Oh, thank you so much. Yep. <clears throat> Claire Levy of Boulder County. Yeah. William Lindstedt, City and County of Broomfield. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Yes. George Teal of Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. Andy Kerr of Jefferson County. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer, City of Arvada. Allison Coombs, City of Aurora. Mike Kaufman, City of Aurora. Royce Pindell, Town of Bennett. David Spellman, City of Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, City of Boulder. Here. <clears throat> Margot Ramsden, Town of Bomar. Jan Plowski, City of Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, City of Castle Pines. Here. Jason Gray, Town of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz, Town of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, City of Centennial. Mike Sutherland, City of Centennial. Cara Tanucci, City of Central. Jeremy Fay, City of, City of Central. Randy Wheel, City of Cherry Hills Village. Russell Stewart, City of Cherry Hills Village. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Susan Noble of Commerce City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Sure. Othaniel Sierra, Sierra of Inglewood. Present. Ari Harrison, Town of Erie. 
Sarah Laughlin, Town of Erie. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Hi. Paul Hazeman of Golden. Here. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Here. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Deslin Sherezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. David Ott of Lock Bowie. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck of Longmont. Here. Ashley Stolzman of Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Here. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Here. Meredith Lighty of North Glen. Richard Kondo of North Glen. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Here. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Julia Marvin of Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. Here. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Glad to be here. Rebecca White of CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee of CDOT. Brian Welch of RTD. Hello. Fantastic. All right. And with that, Mr. Chair, uh, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Matter of fact, I think there are more people here than I've seen in a long time, uh, even, even virtually. So thank you for coming down for this. Uh, next item of business is to move to approve our agenda for this evening. And so I would like to entertain a motion from a member to approve the agenda. Second. I'm sorry, who, mo who moved? Oh, thank you. Thank you. And seconded was uh, Deal. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? No? Okay. We approve the agenda. <clears throat> Next item is report of the chair. I, I just have a, just a brief report or statement that I'd like to make, and I said this at RTC yesterday, and that is when we a little less than a year ago, we had a, a pretty heavy lift uh, presented to us with the, uh, uh, the greenhouse gas issue and the need to revise the 2050 uh, MetroVision RTP. And all through the year, I found myself wondering, can we get to the finish line with something that'll, uh, that'll meet our obligations? And so we did, and we're going to vote on that tonight, and I hope you've all been following along. Uh, but I want to recognize the very hard and dedicated work uh, that Doug and the staff have put into this. Uh, when you see the presentation tonight that wraps everything up in a nice, neat, understandable whole before we do the vote, uh, I think you'll have a deep appreciation for the incredible work that our staff has done on this. So I just wanted to recognize that. Thank you. Uh, next item is report of uh, performance and engagement committee. Uh, when Thank you, Mr. Dr. Chair. Uh, P&E did not meet this evening, so we'll follow up with you next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Report on finance and budget committee, and I believe Director Mulvey chaired that tonight. We also did not meet this evening for lack of a quorum, so we will report again out like next time. We may have a virtual meeting to take care of business that's timely and in the interim. Thank you. A report of the Executive Director, uh, Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. It's great seeing everybody again as we try this in-person thing yet one more time. Um, hopefully we're more successful this, this, this go around. We get more than one meeting in like we did last time back in May. I got a several things I wanted to bring to your attention today. The first is, um, now that we're all back in person again, I, I recognize it's been a long time since, uh, since you know, we did this on a regular basis, and we have a lot of new members. Um, so I just want to let you know that we do, we do order dinner upstairs on board nights. 
So uh, it normally served around five o'clock. We know that you're traveling, you know, during the dinner hour. So we uh, we felt it was appropriate to be able to, to provide uh, dinner for you all. So if you you know you feel you can get here before in a timely fashion to to grab grab dinner, we we welcome you to do so. We want you well nourished for uh, for the action items that we have on the agenda. And also, quite frankly, it's a great way for. For you all to uh, to engage with fellow board members in a more social setting, so we we would welcome you to do that. We'd we'd love to see you all. Um, an announcement on the small communities hot topics forum. Um, those of you and you know who you are, I would hope have received an invitation to attend this small small communities hot topics forum. Um, it is next Thursday from 10 to 2 p.m. and the topics include uh, broadband, water and the IIJA uh, grant uh, navigation. So basically federal grant navigation. So um, we, it's going to be in person. Is lunch. Uh, it's going to be down here in this room, I believe. Registration closes on Friday. So if you could get those in, uh, give, us a, give, give us a number for, uh, for, for lunch orders. Um, I also want to draw your attention to uh, an, an opportunity for the board. Um, we have partnered with the Urban Land Institute for several years now on their technical advisory committees. We've, uh, through the years, have funded in part um, uh, two TAPs, uh, two communities to perform TAPs within their within their jurisdictions on various projects. Um, we are planning on doing that again this year. So if you are interested. You can all just reach out to me, um, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll get you going on that. You can also it's also the application process is open on on ULI Colorado's website as well. But please just reach out to me, and um, and we'll get that going. Um, something else kind of related to technical assistance that I, I just wanted to also draw your attention to is that we're we're piloting kind of a new technical assistance to local governments um, to hopefully facilitate some land use and transportation goals within your region. Um, the intent is to assist local governments with critical land use and transportation opportunities um, where you know progress might have been delayed or complicated for, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so we conducted a call for projects uh, in early summer and we received four project ideas from local governments. Um, we are going to be able to fund all four of those or provide technical assistance to all four of those. So this technical assistance program is a total of $150,000 was available in this call. Um, no one community will get more than 50 and basically that money will go towards the, the, uh, the hiring of a consultant um, to help with uh, the project that, that you're considering. So we received four as I suggested. Um, so the four that are going to get assistance in a, one of two ways, and I'll explain that in a second, is uh, Ralston Road, Multimodal Corridor, and Urban Center Connectivity Reassessment in Arvada, um, Clear Creek Valley Transit Oriented Development Plan Reevaluation in Adams County, and uh, Inglewood Station Multimodal Corridor Conceptual Planning and Design in Inglewood. So those are the three that are going to be receive funding. Uh, the fourth was a little more complicated, and uh, we had conversations with Netherland about what their proposal was, and basically what they want to do is update their parks, recreation, open space, and trail master plan. So we are, we're assisting them right now in um, establishing um, are getting a student to, to uh, do their capstone uh, research, capstone project related to this topic. And uh, so we we're able to, to help all, f all four of those, uh, those, uh, those uh, government, local governments. So we're really excited about that. Um, this is the first round. We anticipate that we're gonna be doing more of this and particularly it's, um, it's gonna be funded as a tip set aside. So we're, we're encouraged by the, uh, the response that we've gotten so far. So thank you all so very much for that. I um, also want to mention to you, we kicked off our Civic Academy last night. It's a seven-week um, a a, a seven program. We had 30-plus participants in this year's, um, this year's Civic Academy. Uh, and it, this year's Academy is focusing on the five themes of your Metro Vision plan. And those five are a connected multimodal region, healthy, inclusive, and livable communities, a vibrant regional economy, an efficient and predictable development pattern and a safe and resilient natural and built environment. So each week, one of those themes will be highlighted in the conversations with, with the participants. And uh, we're off to a great start last night. Like I said, we met and we had a panel discussion 
um, with uh, several folks throughout this region, leaders in their own space talking about various regional models. So um, I was on that panel, Ray Gonzalez from, uh, from Metro Denver EDC was on there. Many of you know Ray is a former county manager in Adams County. I know I saw Director Odoricio come in a little bit ago. Uh, Mike Silverstein from the Regional Air Quality Council was, was on that panel. Bob McDonald um, from City County Denver, uh, he was on that, but he was representing the Metro Denver Partnership for Health and uh, Carrie McCarowitz from CU Denver, she gave kind of an academic perspective on regionalism. So it was pretty cool. We had a great, great uh, discussion with the participants and a big shout out to Sheila Lynch and Kelsey Forfour Jones that have been uh, coordinating the event this year. So thank you. All right, we're late in September, we're heading into October, and that means for our agency, it's uh, Go-tober. And that is uh, during the month of October, we solicit area employers to sign up for our annual uh, campaign to promote commute options in the workplace. It's a competitive environment. There were companies compete against each other at their various stages based on the number of employees that they have. Um, and they win both employers and, and employees. Uh, they have the opportunity to compete for prizes and the ultimate winners are recognized in the Denver Biz Business Journal. We take out a, is it a full page ad, Steve? That half page, page ad, just recognizing the, uh, the accomplishments that they, that they do and thank them for, for all their efforts. Last but not least, I just wanna mention this COG Cares we have a voluntary internal program where we try to get back to the community and we, we have various activities throughout the year. We have two upcoming activities in October. Uh, one is a trail building opportunity, a legacy trail down in Douglas County, um, and a tool maintenance event in Lakewood. And uh, uh, they're both with volunteers for outdoor, Outdoors Colorado. So we're excited about that. It's a good opportunity for us to, to get together and and uh, for some fellowship and all that kind of good stuff and, and do some good in the, in, in, the, uh, in the region. But I also, the reason I bring it up is because if you know of any opportunities that you think we might be well suited to actually put on a pair of boots and actually do, do, some, do some work on the ground, we'd be happy to do that. So please just, just let us know, just reach out to me and we'll follow up and, and uh, we'll, we, uh, we're always looking for new, new and exciting ways to, uh, to get back. So. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug, appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is public comment. Uh, we allocate up to 45 minutes for public comment. Speakers are limited to three minutes. Uh, if there are additional requests uh, for the public to address the board, we'll allocate time at the end of the meeting. Let me ask, uh, we, we don't take comment on any pending public hearings uh, before the, or which a prior public hearing has been held. Um, and consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. We have, uh, well, hello. Okay. Uh, Randall. Blow. Randall, sorry, Randall. Oh, I've known no, you for years. Fine. And I, <laughs> uh, I used Randall. to be here when Cherry Creek was where you met, actually, when I first attended. <laughs> Long time ago. Any of you know where that is. Yes. Randall, go ahead, you have three minutes. So my first interest in talking to you, and I usually don't go by these things, but I have to, is basic income. And I have all the material here because I made a presentation on Saturday to a group at South High School regarding this. And basic income will help 820 people. In October, they are going to be chosen, and they're going to basically be chosen by the basic income project, and they will be a part of a year-long study to see if this works. However, there are places in the world where this is just basically done for everybody. I don't need to go into where, but there are many. And if you Google it, you can learn just as much as I did. Uh, and I'm hoping to be one of them. I live at Aloft Hotel. This Friday, I'm going to have surgery on my left knee and recuperate there, and hopefully by the end of the year, find somewhere else to live. In 2023, I'm the chair of the Social, Colorado Social Legislative Committee, and that's a daunting task for a person like me in the first place. And we're the oldest advocacy group at the state legislature on issues of every description you can think of, including transportation and every policy that comes up in the legislature. We were started in 1971, and uh, we've always met 
in person, but we're now g moving to a hybrid me a method of doing, not a hybrid, but a Zoom method of doing it. Tony Larson on October 6th at 5 p.m. on Zoom will be doing a presentation from the League of Women Voters on the 11 uh, measures uh, that are coming from you to you from the state legislature. And I brought my copy in case you haven't read it yet. Mine I have to read in Spanish and English because of the fact that I'm a bilingual poll worker and have been since 2000 at Glen Arm Rec Center. And uh, I'm privileged to be able to do that as I am to be able to talk to you uh, because I really have enjoyed my interaction. I was part of the Citizen Academy, actually, and I'm going to be on a panel discussing that after I'm able to hobble around again, fortunately. Uh, and so I really look at this as a pregnant place to develop and entertain work throughout the area. So one admonition I have for you, which my partner at the Colorado Coalition tried to get started through MDHI, is to have outreach all through the metro region along the front range. We have a lot of people who will be displaced by the fact that these hotels and everything are closing down. We need to make sure that we have a network of consolidated outreach to people so that at least they can get the basic dignity of having someone they trust to basically interface with them to help them receive services. And I probably have outlived my time, but I want to also compliment RTD um, for the, um, the idea of having free access to transit. It was a wonderful thing. I've been an RTD customer through my EcoPass with Bayot Enterprises since the pandemic, and I really appreciate it. But I would also add, as I did at the Citizen Academy and also at the MetroVision 2050 um, development, that we have free transportation for all citizens throughout the metro area. Thank and you, of Randy. course, the greatest task we have is to be a citizen, so vote. Thank you, Randall. Good evening. Uh, appreciate that very much. Are there any other members of the public here in attendance who want to offer a uh, comment? If not, I believe we have at least one person online. We do not? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Who do we have online? Um, okay. Uh, a representative from Bicycle Colorado. Uh, when you are unmuted and can speak, could you just give us your name, please, and then give us your comments? Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Rachel Holtin. Can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so Rachel Haltine, uh, Sustainable uh, Transportation Director for Bicycle Colorado. I'm also the Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Wheat Ridge. And I'm here tonight, uh, I believe if I understand correctly from Director uh, Flynn's comments that you have already taken comment on the greenhouse gas rule. Is that correct? I'm sorry, uh, we did have a public hearing on that. And we ask that people not comment on items for which we did already have a public hearing. Okay, great. Well, then I would like to thank Director Winshaw for giving me a fabulous tour of Lone Tree this week. Uh, I went out there and we jumped on the light rail and we started at the first of five light rail stops that go through Lone Tree and really got a, a fantastic story of where Lone Tree was 20 years ago, where they are today, and what they're thinking for the next 20 years. We then got off the light rail and had a chance to go through um, some of the areas around Ridgegate. And um, I just, uh, I am, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, I'm the mayor pro tem of Wheat Ridge, but I'm a huge fan of what Lone Tree is doing. Incredibly vibrant, um, lots of people out and about you know, great construction going on everywhere. And so I just wanted to personally thank Director Winshaw for the tour. And uh, we're really hoping to give uh, everyone in the room a chance to get out there and take a look at the great things Lone Tree's doing. Uh, they're bringing transportation and land use together in a way that uh, is exciting and clearly is something that people desire because uh, I could not believe how many people I saw out and about. So that's all I have to say. Uh, good luck tonight. And thank you again, Director Shaw. Thank you very much, Rachel. I believe that Director Shaw wants to offer a rebuttal. Uh, 
Thank you, Rachel. That was it. <laughs> okay, I was sitting back. I was expecting more. Now, you told us uh, up at the executive committee that you were doing an event uh, or a, another tour later, if you want to mention yes, the other directors. We, we would like, uh, we will extend an invitation to everyone here and Dr. Cog's staff and uh, assorted others. Um, we'd love to have you hear the story of the evolution of Lone Tree and um, join in the uh, greenhouse gas exchange, as we have temporarily named it. That's our working name. And um, so we're looking forward. Our, our working date is uh, November 9th. Um, so mark your calendar, um, tentatively 8.30 to 10.30, but we're firming up the date. So watch for our email from Bicycle Colorado. Thank you. Thank you for, for, uh, for that. I don't know about greenhouse gas exchange. Get your marketing people working on that, please. <laughs> And, and that would have been more appropriate at the end of the meeting, other matters by members, but it was very appropriate in given Rachel's comments. So thank you very much for that invitation. Um, next item is, uh, do we have anyone else online? Let me ask. Okay, thank you. As item seven, uh, to motion to approve the consent agenda, which consists of three items. I hope that directors have had a chance to review their packets before uh, showing up tonight or tonight if they arrived early. Anybody has any questions on that? Uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Approval. Let's see. Whoop. <laughs> there, there, there went your, your proofer. All right, uh, Director Hazen. Any second? Second. Uh, Director Starker. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? I'm sorry, and that was, so, okay. Thank you. Next item, main event. Our first action item, discussion of the 2022 update of the 2050 Metro Vision RTP, Jacob Rieger. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Jacob Rieger, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Um, this has been a long journey, as the chair noted. Uh, we appreciate you being with us. Let's get to the finish line. So first, just to be transparent, uh, what we're asking you to adopt tonight, we are asking you to adopt the updated 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, and it's now 20 appendices, most of which haven't changed, but two in particular that have changed, one, one that's um, has changed and one that's new. Um, the air quality conformity determination documents, we update those every single time uh, that we make a major change to the Regional Transportation Plan, that's Appendix S. And then Appendix T is a new appendix that's required by the state greenhouse gas planning standard. It's the greenhouse gas transportation report. It itself has several appendices or sub-appendices, including the mitigation action plan. So it's all part of the ecosystem of the updated 2050 regional transportation plan. And these are the action documents um, that we are asking for approval for this evening. Um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. You've seen much of this before. This is a new slide. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but just for transparency and documentation, we did wanna kind of lay out the process that we've been through over the last nine months. Um, North Front Range MPO did a slide like this. We liked it, so we stole the format. But basically, we just wanted to kind of show, you know, the evolution of this journey, the timing of the major tasks, the process that we went through um, to get to this point and kind of lay that out in a timeline format. Um, this is all review on this slide, so I'm not going to go through this except, of course, to make the point, as the chair noted at the beginning, um, per the greenhouse gas planning standard, um, in the rule, there is the deadline of October 1st for Dr. Cog to adopt a revised 2050 regional transportation plan that complies uh, with the reduction levels in the greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, so, of course, we're asking you to do that tonight. We need to do that by October 1st. Um, this, again, you've, you've seen this already as well, but this comes from the rule. This is just a reminder. 
of the reduction levels that are specified in the rule for the agencies that are um, that um, the rule applies to. So it's the five metropolitan planning organizations in this great state, um, as well as CDOT um, also had to comply with this rule. Um, Dr. Cog's total, so these are million metric tons um, for, for analysis years, 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050. So basically at that regional level in our regional MPO area, these are the reduction levels in the rule that we need to meet. Um, because that's not very intuitive in million metric tons, uh, we did just sort of do this translation to just kind of relate this to, um, you know, converting it to the number of gas-powered vehicles to electric, just something maybe we can all understand more on a day-to-day -day basis. So we just kind of did that um, conversion just to put these numbers in a little bit more plain English. Um, again, you've also seen this slide, so really just the reminder here that one of the big lessons learned for us and one of the big takeaways um, in this nine months of work is that it really did take a framework of strategies um, in order to meet the reduction levels. It wasn't just two or three or five or seven things. It was more like 15 or 20 things. This slide summarizes the major themes or the major buckets of uh, those strategies that we put together in this framework to demonstrate compliance with the rule. Um, again, you've seen this as well. I just want to really just have this for documentation and for new members as well. Um, the rule is admittedly complex. The process to comply with the rule is complex. So we wanted to lay out, hopefully in kind of plain English, the process and the workflow, a little bit like the first slide, but this is more about the major steps in the workflow that we used um, through our technical analysis and through our work together um, to comply with the rule. Um, this was a fun slide. This is review. I said at the time there'd be a quiz on this. We forgot to do that before. We'll do that at the end of this meeting. It looks complicated, but it's, it's uh, not as complicated as it looks. Really, the point of this slide is that when we started this work, we spent a lot of time initially um, really sort of thinking about and doing a lot of good technical work on how to translate things that we don't typically model. Because in our model, in the plan, you know, we model the major multimodal projects, those big projects that are in the plan. We don't typically model what we call the non-project specific programmatic investments in the plan. You know, these are things like bike paths and sidewalks and intersection improvements and smaller scale things that in a 30 year plan, you wouldn't necessarily identify individual projects, but I call those the connective tissue of our transportation system. They're really important and we needed to find a way to reflect them in our technical analysis. So really all of this is conveying is just those categories of programmatic investments that are in our plan, in our adopted plan and in our financial plan, how we could represent them in our travel demand modeling. We also talked about project modifications. There were some important and I'd say strategic product, project modifications in the plan to those major multimodal projects that we list, map, and model within the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, no new information here, you all have seen this before, but I'd make the point, while these are important changes and these are the major changes that we made to the plan, both to comply with the greenhouse gas planning standard um, and also we did a what we call cycle amendment request where projects, project sponsors could ask for changes in the plan. That's incorporated here as well. But at the end of the day, the amended plan, the revised plan, includes all of those major multimodal projects and all of those programmatic investments for the entire region. And as when we initially did the plan and as we've gone through this process, we've really you know, taken to heart, we are a very diverse region. We do have unique needs in each of our 50 plus communities and we always try and reflect that um, in our planning work. There isn't a one size fits all. While this is a regional effort and it's very important, we've tried to balance that with what we know is needed and important flexibility within your individual communities. And that I think is reflected, I hope, in our planning process here, but also in the plan as revised. We also spent a lot of time talking about the mitigation action plan, so I'm not gonna go through these bullets again, except I'm just gonna take the opportunity one more time at the local government jurisdictional level as a reminder that the mitigation action plan and the mitigation measures in the mitigation action plan are completely voluntary uh, for local governments. There's not a requirement that any particular local government implement a particular measure at a particular time or place. However, to be transparent, as part of the work tonight to comply with the rule, I, sorry, um, as part of, part of your work tonight to comply with the rule, you will be adopting a mitigation action plan. Um, but our promise to the region is to work with all of you, again, honoring that flexibility, uh, working with jurisdictions who are interested um, in uh, implementing mitigation measures as you see fit in your community over the next several years. Um, these, let me just go through the animation here. These are the specific mitigation measures in the mitigation action plan. Part of the requirements of the rule is 
um, of course, identifying and analyzing these measures where they might be applicable in this region um, and the greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with each measure. This is the only time when we're actually using actual tons. Everything else in the rule is million metric tons. So finally, all that work, you put it all together. Again, you've seen this table before as well, but transparently and as required by the rule, we want to show when you have that strategy of that framework strategy of all the things that we're doing to comply with the rule, you put them all together. We show the emission reductions at the regional level associated with that strategy framework. And we compare that to the reduction levels that I showed you that are required in the rule for the Dr. Cog MPO region. Really what we're trying to make sure here is that the bold black fourth row, the total GHG reductions is greater or higher than the bold red row, uh, which is the reduction levels that are required by the rule specified for this region. And indeed, you know, we can show for each of the four analysis years that are required, we do meet uh, the emission reduction levels. Again, I want to make the point, yes, compliance with the rule is super important. It's all I've been doing for the past nine months, but it's not just about checking a box of numbers. It's really about building on the good planning work that all of you and all of us have done in this region. We oriented our mitigation action plan that way. We've oriented this work to really continue to build on that foundation of everything that we're doing in this region and that you're doing in your communities. This to us is about good planning, not just rule compliance. So again, to be transparent in terms, what does this all mean in terms of the document and the plan? When we originally adopted the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan in April of 2021, over on the left-hand side, we adopted the main plan document, and at the time, what were 19 appendices that contain lots of really good and exciting and uh, informative data and information responding to state and federal requirements, showing our methodologies and other things that are required to be in the plan. For this plan update, uh, for the 2022 update, we've made some routine updates to the plan document consistent with the work that I've described this evening. We made some routine and minor updates to a few of the appendices. Many of the appendices actually didn't change, uh, but some of them did. For example, the financial plan change. Um, updates to the air quality conformity documents, as I said, we do that every single time that we make a major change to the plan. And then as I noted, um, in compliance with the rule, a new appendix, Appendix T, the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report, that really sort of brings together everything we did to update the plan, but specifically around complying with the greenhouse gas planning standard, showing our methodology, showing how the model works, showing how we did our technical analysis, the emission reductions associated with that work, um, how the models work, um, even our engagement as part of the greenhouse gas transportation report to bring together to document transparently everything that we did in this update process. Um, we did have a 31-day public comment period from August 7th through September 6th. We had a social pinpoint engagement site where we had these plan documents available, many different ways that people could interact with the plan and people could comment. Uh, we had five virtual public meetings during that 31-day period. We varied them by day of the week and time of day just to give you know, people a, a chance to participate. Uh, for two of those, we actually had Spanish interpretation, Spanish translation. Um, as you all remember, we had a, um, our virtual public hearing in front of you all, in front of a special meeting of the Dr. Cog Board on September 7th. Um, that was the first time that we tried out both Spanish translation and American Sign Language um, interpretation. I think that went pretty well. We want to continue to institutionalize those kinds of accessibility practices in our work. Um, this is just some example of some of the e-blast social media, some things that we did to get the word out um, during the public comment period. We also got some media coverage during the public comment period, and we had a lot of engagement, and we were really pleased by this. We, were, we weren't sure what to expect, but we had a lot of people going to the site. People could comment on our idea wall. People could mark up the documents directly. Um, altogether, we had close to 350 comments through the public comment period and the public hearing. Just by that metric of volume of comments, that was actually more than we had for the original plan. In terms of sort of summarizing the disposition of those comments, I'm always leery of doing that because there were a lot of different types of comments. Again, there's 350 comments. I hesitate to kind of put my own spin on, on you know, what are really sort of comprehensive and nuanced comments, but we did include them. That's part of our work every time we do a, a public comment period, public review period. We show you all of the comments that we received and we try to respond to every single comment, even if that response is just, you know, thank you for your opinion, thank you for commenting. But that's part of our work. We want to be transparent and show you what we received. Um, but in terms of our summary of, of the types of comments we received, we did get support for the proposed updates to the plan to comply with the state greenhouse gas planning standard. We also got support for the updates, but some commenters, you know, with a desire that um, in their mind that they want us to shift even more 
um, investment further from roadways and highways to transit and other multimodal travel options. Um, not similarly, um, oppositely, is that a word? Um, oppositely. Um, <laughs> we also had um, a contingent of comments of folks who said that, um, you know, they, they oppose, they, um, no, sorry, they opposed the updates. They, they did not support the updates, the proposed updates, um, didn't, you know, didn't support the greenhouse gas planning standard. They expressed a preference for additional roadway and highway oriented investment in the region. And then we had some comments that I would characterize as being neutral or technical in nature. We did have um, a few of our technical staff, your staff, actually review and mark up the documents. We appreciated that. And interestingly, this is the first time we ever did this. We had an idea wall on the social pinpoint site, kind of not quite like a blog, but sort of an interactive, sort of like Facebook or something, where folks could give comments, but then people could comment on comments. People could like or I think even dislike comments. So we had this dynamic of people interacting with each other directly um, that we'd never had before. And I think it was actually some pretty interesting dialogue, and we tried to reflect that in the comments matrix. I also want to be transparent about, you know, how did the plan change based on the public comment period? Because we did do a few things. Um, there were some staff initiated revisions to the plan. We did make a correction to table one of the greenhouse gas transportation report. We also issued an errata sheet that was on our social pinpoint site for this. Um, it didn't change the content or the outcome of it, but what we did was we realized that for the 2025 analysis year, we were showing mitigation action plan calculations for that analysis year. We don't actually need the mitigation action plan for 2025. Um, so that was a little bit an error. Um, so we, we corrected that, but again, it didn't change the overall outcome. Um, we did have what's known as a copy editing or sort of grammatical sort of review of the document correction to page 11 of the greenhouse gas transportation report. Um, this was in the additional programmatic investment section. Um, the content there was correct, but we ended up with a sentence fragment that made it, you know, confusing to just kind of read it literally. Um, so we fixed that. And then we had a formula correction to subappendix C of Appendix T, which is the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. That appendix deals with model outputs. It's just a table of model outputs. Uh, we just had a summation formula error that was incorrect, uh, so we corrected that. And then based specifically on the public comment period, um, we did make some, um, we added some references to transit, and so including transit in some references to the project descriptions on some of the projects in Arapahoe County that we were changing or proposing to change as part of this work um, that's in table 3.1 of the main plan document. Um, this was based on input in our, core, in our coordination with Arapahoe County stakeholders. They asked us to reflect that transit is part of those projects and to describe them as such in the plan, which we did. So before I get to the proposed motion, I wanna end on two quick things. I first wanna thank all of you, um, again, for being on this journey. It's been a lot of work. I wanna thank you and your staff um, all of the stakeholders for coming with us on, on this partnership. Um, it has been important work and we really appreciate it. In particular, I do want to say thank you to CDOT. Uh, while we've been doing this work, as I've said, they are subject to the rule as well. They've been updating their 10 year, um, 10, 10 year transportation plan. Hopefully I got that right, Rebecca. It's a 10 year plan for CDOT. Um, and we work really closely together because there needs to be consistency. There needs to be collaboration between CDOT's 10 year plan and our 2050 regional transportation plan. We did include additional information in the packet regarding the 10 year plan update if you're interested in that. So I wanna thank CDOT as well. And then finally, I also wanna thank Dr. Cog's staff. I have the privilege of managing this and presenting it to you, but we would not be here tonight with, without the efforts of about 10, or excuse me, 15 to 20 Dr. Cog staff in three different divisions of Dr. Cog. It really took a team uh, to put this together and I wanna recognize all the staff who worked on this. So with that, we are asking you to um, approve this motion um, to adopt the updated 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I wanted to kick off the discussion with actually making a motion on the floor and having it seconded and then, let, then let's have the discussion uh, so that we can proceed that way. Uh, would anybody like to offer the motion? Mr. Chair? It's Director Conklin. I move to adopt a resolution adopting the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and the associated Dr. Cog PM10 conformity determination, Denver Southern Subarea eight hour ozone conformity determination, and greenhouse gas transportation. Thank you. And I have a second from Director Williams. He beat you to it. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. And the first comment or question I have with Director Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As a uh, member of the Regional uh, Air Quality uh, Commission and uh, a, a county commissioner in Arapahoe County, I want to commend the staff for all the hard work in putting this together. We're approaching uh, a 
uh, severe non-attainment non, non with, with our uh, clean air issues, and I think that uh, this is a, an important step. In Arapahoe County, we have uh, moved forward with a pilot project to uh, uh, purchase seven uh, electric vehicles in a variety of configurations to begin to examine the uh, uh, this economic benefit of moving to a uh, electric vehicle uh, transportation mode. But I would urge all uh, uh, members of this organization to uh, to support this effort. Thank you, Director. See no other hands up, uh, Director Levy. Well, I, I think I want to pile on with that just to first express appreciation to staff for all this work. Um, you know, you, you brought it to us sort of tied up in a bow. Um, you made it all balance out and, and um, you actually made it seem a little easier than I ever thought it would be. Not that any of this is going to be easy. I'm looking... I'm looking at the main components of this and and they're all here and you've done the math and I trust the model, I think. Um, <laughs> it's a black box to me. I don't know what's in that model. Uh, the, the, just the only note of caution is that we're gonna have to stick to it and we're gonna have to, we're, you know, we're gonna have to say no to, to some things that people are gonna want us to say yes to. And we're also gonna have to be prepared to to do some things if it turns out that that the modeling wasn't quite right, and I, you know, so we're, you know, we we got here, we're ready to vote, and I hope we do have a unanimous vote to approve this. But we, you know, we're going to have to really stick to our guns and make sure that that uh, we we do reduce greenhouse gas emissions in accordance with the uh, the requirements. Thank you, Richard Baker. What button do I put there? Oh, thank you. There you go. Uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with the modeling, but inside the black boxes are assumptions. When we look into the future, we have to make assumptions. So I'd like to explore assumptions that we base this on. First one that pops right off the thing, what do you think the population, we have a population of roughly three million, about 3.5 million, yes. 3.5 million. And what is it going to be in 2050? By 2050, we're going to add almost a million more folks to this region. Because that will have a dramatic impact on whether we can meet the goals, correct? So if the population growth is more than that, we're fine. Uh, what is the assumption on cars? Are we still going to have the same number of cars per person? that we have today, private vehicles? Uh, Director Baker, I'm thinking about how to answer that. Our, uh, firstly, just a little bit of context. Our travel demand modeling is very complex, and part of what we've done in this work <coughs> is documentation that's in the greenhouse gas report about our model and our modeling assumptions. Um, to your point, that there are, there are assumptions that we're using in our modeling process. Uh, we have a pretty sophisticated um, behavior-based model that we use and that um, CDOT um, also uses as well. In that context, to directly answer your question, I'm going to look back to Steve Cook. I don't want to say it incorrectly. Steve, please help me out. Hello, Steve Cook. Uh, is this working? Um, manager of Mobility Analytics and Transportation Operations. A short answer is yes, essentially it's assuming about the same type of automobile ownership through the future. It's not like a one button that we push to say everything is gonna be exactly the same, but it just assumes that there's gonna be similar types of patterns going into the future as we add these million more people. Um, there's no like exact number, is it 2% less, 1% more, but it's essentially the same because there's nothing that we have in terms of laws, rules, regulations that indicates at the moment that it's going to change one way or the other. And for the assumptions in our model, that's what we always need. We need something to 
to go by if we, if we, if we change any factor in the model. You know, there's got to be a law, there's got to be a rule, um, there's got to be a real thing that changed, such as working at home, which increased greatly during the pandemic and is still, you know, it went up like this, now it's come up, but it's a lot higher than it used to be. That is projected to continue into the future, the working at home. All, all reports we've seen, uh, new census numbers that have come out this week indicate for, for um, teleworking or working at home, but that will continue at a very high level into the future. And don't, and don't think that I'm trying to hold you to something impossible. I mean, you have a report before us that we're talking more than a decade of man hour work for. We're going to, in 20 minutes, understand what that is. But I think these assumptions are really powerful. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> because, because also, have you assumed a gas efficiency change? As an example, if we go back to 1962, probably the fleet mileage from our cars in Denver Metro was 12 miles a gallon. And today, we're probably looking at a fleet, a total fleet average of more than 25. So have you built any of those assumptions? Plus also, what do you think the uh, makeup of those fleets of private vehicles will be? Hey, they're probably what? 1% electric? Do we think that's going to change? And how much comes from that change? And some of the reasons that? So, sorry, Director Baker, your first question about the efficiency of gallons per mile. Miles per gallon. Yes, yeah. No, we do We do incorporate that. We do incorporate electrification of the fleet. It's part of our modeling. It's also part of our air quality conformity, our federal requirements that we do as well every time that we update the plan. And while I don't want to cut you off, I want you to feel free to ask me whatever you want to ask me. You are raising a good point that I do want to make to everyone. This is not a one-and-done sort of deal. This is not a set it and forget it. We update this plan. We do a major update every four years. We do what we call sort of minor cycle amendments every single year to the plan. So you're absolutely right. And we always say transportation planning is a snapshot in time. These things do change. The assumptions are important. Uh, we continuously update the plan to reflect what's changing in our world. And is there any place where you have these assumptions laid out for the public to see? Yes, sir. It's in our, I forget which sub-appendix, but it's in Appendix T of the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. We have an appendix dedicated to our focus travel modeling, and we have an appendix dedicated to the EPA moves the motor vehicle emissions model that we use uh, for air quality conformity and greenhouse gas emissions. So then a bunch of my other questions, ha you have there what you think uh, the transportation mode uh, breakdown will be is versus private vehicles versus mass transit versus work at home. Those are all in the appendix? Yes, sir. Okay. So and we do forecast that, yes. Is there any place where you have the impact this will have on an individual? We, so it's a good question. We, you know, try to paint a picture. I mean, planning is about storytelling. We try to paint a picture by 2050 based on this plan and based on the investments in the plan. And, you know, not just transit, but roadways and programs and services and, you know, everything that it takes in our multimodal transportation system you know, what that will mean for the region. So, for example, Appendix E of the plan shows some of those major statistics. That's more from a data perspective. But in Chapter 4 of the plan, we also try to paint that picture a little bit. What, what does this kind of mean at the end of the day, you know, for people living and working and visiting this region over time? And uh, we also have to talk about unintended consequences besides the intended consequences. I've read parts of this plan as an intentional uh, push to end traffic congestion. I would respectfully disagree. Um, that is not our intent. Um, we recognize this is a very diverse region. Um, each community in this region is very unique. Um, yes, there is a lot of multimodal investment in the plan. It's really about giving people options, and it's giving people mobility freedom. Part of that mobility freedom, though, is driving. People do need to drive for certain trips. 
There are a lot of roadway oriented, roadway based um, project investments in the plan and in the programmatic investments, as I mentioned, intersection operations, safety, uh, maintenance, you know, those you know, traffic signals um, is actually part of our part of our strategy for the greenhouse gas um, compliance. So all of the above, and that's the approach that we've taken in this planning work. So you because I think that it will be an inevitability that a million people with the same number of private vehicles, a city that's based on suburbs. Suburbs are completely dependent on private vehicles. There is no walkability, and riding a bike might be good for a 20-something or 30-something, but if you talk about a family or children or old people, it's just ridiculous. So this is an area completely dependent on motor vehicles, not going to be laying out new grid plans, overriding a million people and their vehicles, and we're not increasing the capacity of our roadways, how can, how can congestion not be inevitable? Director, what I'd say is that in the plan, um, there are many roadway projects. There's important managed lane projects to I-25, to I-70, to I-270. Um, there's bottleneck projects on C-470. I could go on, but the point is that there are roadway projects. We do recognize, um, again, as I said, that each part of the region is very diverse and needs different things, um, and the plan is oriented towards trying to recognize um, and address the unique needs of each part of our region. Sometimes that does mean transit and bikeways and, and you know, multimodal options. Sometimes it does mean roadway improvements, freeway improvements, intersection improvements, certainly safety improvements across the region, to your point. But there is a physical component that you cannot uh, mitigate. Uh, I'm speaking specifically of the remove six laning components in the uh, my understanding of traffic transportation, uh, two-lane street, one way in each direction, can carry 18,000 cars a day. A four-lane street can carry 6,000 cars a day, and a six-lane street can carry 54,000 cars a day. And if we reduce from 54,000 cars a day to 36,000 cars a day, there's an inevitable consequence to that. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. What I'll say is that for those projects, and they're in Arapahoe County, we worked with the project sponsors, and we had a significant amount of coordination with those project sponsors, both at the municipal level and the county level, to work through those project changes, and ultimately they did support um, those project changes, and they've been incorporated in the plan as such. My last question, because you've been very generous with your time, and I appreciate it. Uh, where is this million person growth going to come? Do you have a projection for that? In terms of, yeah, so like locate like where they're coming from or going or the uh, source of that. They, because roads go from some place to some place. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I know in Adams County alone, uh, Puerto Rico could speak completely about this, but several hundred thousand people both expectations. Yeah, so I can so give a separate a map presentation. Of that or I'm sorry. you have a map of that in the Appendix T? Um, we actually have a map in Chapter 2 of the main document that shows the changes in both households and employment. It's either population or households and employment um, between 2020 and 2050. Um, I could give a separate presentation on that, but the short answer for now is that uh, we have a team at Dr. Cog that works very closely with all of the local governments in this region and the state demography office um, to take census information, employment information, lots of data and information to work together to create um, those long-range land use forecasts, those growth and development forecasts. Are these really similar to the ones in the 2040 vision where you talked about activity centers that had higher population densities and employment within um, somewhat similar. Since 2040, the sort of the the amount of growth will be about the same. The sort of timing of that growth will be a little bit different. We're going to start to slow in terms of our growth by 2050. Um, I think you're talking about urban centers. 
those are part of our strategy, but they are locally requested, locally designated, um, regionally adopted um, urban centers as part of our strategy. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and in this corner, we have Director Levy. Oh, you rate, okay. I thought you wanted in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Director Sutton. Lit up. There you go. There okay, you there go. we go. There you go. Um, so the, the this whole thing is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting. I understand that we measure ozone quite regularly, and we can track progress as to whether or not ozone is getting better. I've been involved in some of these greenhouse gas emission inventory projects for local governments, and they seem like rabbit holes of doom. Really wonder. How do we measure whether we have successfully reduced greenhouse gas emissions in the, the, the Dr. Cog region? What, what are the mechanisms by we, which we make measurements of the actual truth of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So I'd say in a nutshell, first of all, acknowledge that this is forecast-based. It is model-based. Um, and it's, it is somewhat similar. There are some unique similarities and differences, but in this context, there are some similarities with traffic volumes, vehicle miles traveled, ozone, and, you know, criteria pollutants. These are all sort of forecasted things um, through what Director Baker was talking about, some of our assumptions in our regional travel model and our other data. So, as I said, this is a snapshot in time. We will continue to update and revise and come back to this work pretty frequently um, because as the world changes, as assumptions, as conditions change, we will keep running our models. We'll keep doing those forecasts to understand where do we think we are, where do we think we're going, and how do we need to, how do we need to adjust over time. Does that answer your question, sir? Um, well, if ozone gets worse, do we know that, the, that we failed on greenhouse gas emissions? I feel like ozone is a truth, right? The greenhouse gas emissions are a mystery. I'm just curious what that, the story is with respect to that. I would actually say the opposite. Greenhouse gas is essentially, Ron's going to look at me, I know where Steve's going. Greenhouse gas is essentially the fuel that's burned. We burn 4,100,000 gallons of gasoline a day in the Denver region. So that's from Department of Revenue information. That is one thing we can actually track because there is a virtually one-to-one -one comparison between greenhouse gases, CO2, the CO2 element of greenhouse gases, and the fossil fuels that are burned. So that one is actually easy to look at over the years. So five years from now, we can see to that 4 million gallons a day go down to 3.6 million gallons. The director Rex wanted to come, uh, oh. add to this. No, and, and Steve is exactly correct, right? And you're, and you're right, Director Sutton. I mean, there's no monitors in the field, right, that, that monitor greenhouse gases. And those that have been in the ozone world for a long time, it's hard to really, you know, wrap your head around exactly what that looks like, right? What are we trying to get to? There are proxies, right? And that's what Steve's suggesting, that fuel consumption is one that we could measure for something like that. Um, I would welcome if, if Rebecca has any thoughts on, on that, you know, from, from CDOT, because, of course, they created the rule. Um, about other proxies that could be used. Uh, Director White, go ahead. Am I on? Uh, uh, fuel sales is one, absolutely. And the other we could look at is we have a very good idea of VMT, vehicle miles traveled, and just convert that into to greenhouse gases by knowing the vehicle fleet mix. So those are the two ways we can get at that. Um, you, may, you have a good point. And in fact, we have a, as part of the obligation with this rule to provide regularly regular reports on what we're seeing coming from the sector over time. So we'll have a good sense. Um, however, cars aren't the only source of emissions from transportation. So there's heavy duty trucks as well, aviation, of course, but we have a good way to, to get an understanding of it. Thank you. Uh, Director Stolzman. Thank you so much. So I just sort of want to level set. About a year ago, we were in a position where we were debating the rule that CDOT was adopting, and that's not what we're doing tonight. Some of us thought the rule should be more aggressive. Some, some of us thought the rule should be less aggressive. But there is a rule in front of us, and there are obligations as Dr. Cog we have to meet or CDOT controls our funding streams. 
And so our staff have laid out a process and a plan that complies with the rule so that we will be in control of our funding streams instead of the Transportation Commission. So from a very boring standpoint, I would hope we all vote in favor of the rule this evening. Um, I think the staff have worked really hard to get us where we are. And, you know, earlier this evening, I had station area envy of Lone Tree because we heard about their five stations, which sounds awesome because, you know, those of us still waiting for fast tracks investment would love to have a station. And so to hear about five stations, it sounds amazing. And they've really done a lot with transit-oriented development. And the plan calls for this voluntary use of land use mixed with transit to promote higher ridership in areas. So that's, I mean, things like what Lone Tree's voluntarily done will continue to happen to help us meet the goal. But I'm just really encouraged by staff working um, to show us a path that we can comply with the rule and hit our targets. And so I'll be voting in favor. And I just want to thank the staff for all the work that's gone into it. Thank you. Now, Director Mulvey. Go on. Hello. Um, echoing some of, actually, the, the confluence of comments here, I want to thank not just staff and Jacob and your staff's hard work, but also our members here, because we really engaged in a lot of discussion on all of this, and we have different views. As um, Member Baker said, there's a big difference in some municipalities, some small towns. We've talked about all that. And the idea that this is based on projections and that it's voluntary, I think is really significant because it allows the municipalities and the members to decide what they can and cannot do, and then we can revisit it. I also don't agree with some of the stuff. I mean, we don't always all agree. And I, you've all heard me voice views about how do you measure all of this? And we've heard the best information that we can have to do this compliance modeling, and it is significant. So that's my comment. But I, I truly want to thank everybody because we have had a lot of open discussion. And the fact that we're able to do that, no matter where we stand on the issue, is meaningful to me. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, Director Odoricio. Can you, uh, I, I just want to say I, I appreciate all the dialogue that we've had over the last uh, few months, year. Uh, I think we've been able to talk about uh, various communities that have different identities and different needs. I would like to really thank staff. I'd like to thank the members too, all of the directors, for coming together because we did have some debates. We did talk about what it what works for you and your community may not work for me and my community. And I think what we have here is an, an opportunity um, to take advantage of the flexibility and the autonomy that was also protected. And that was important for Adams County in our land use autonomy, um, but also the flexibility to say that we all do things a little differently. What happens and how they do it in Denver might be different than how they do it in Arapahoe, which might be different than how we do it in Adams and how we do it differently in Boulder. So I just want to thank you all. And just keep in mind that the flexibility is important and the flexibility is important to make sure that we're staying on track, not with just the greenhouse gas, but also make sure that we're staying on track to not be stifling the growth because there are still a lot of communities that are growing. But it doesn't mean that we have to grow the way that our grandparents grew their communities. There's new ways to doing it. And I firmly believe that there's a, there's a way to do it uh, where we can reduce the impacts to the environment and long-term sustainability of our communities while also maximizing the benefits because we can't build a wall around Colorado and make Texas and California pay for it as much as we'd like. Uh, so we will have a million new people here and we got to figure out how to do it. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Hogan. Here. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, commend staff and follow everyone uh, recognizing the excellent work, so much work, so fast, um, and with so much input and engagement. Thank you for that. Um, I do remain concerned by the fact that some of the mitigation measures are voluntary. Um, I would have liked to see them linked to funding, as I've stated a couple times before, and made closer to mandatory. And I recognize this is the best we seem able to do right now. And as Director Mulvey said, nobody's going to be 100% happy with, with where we're at, which probably means we're in a pretty good spot. 
Um, I think we may get to more mandatory changes to things like land use and parking policy um, because we as a society don't really have a good track record of voluntarily changing our behavior. We're already being impacted by flood, fire, drought, extreme heat, extreme cold. And I think we're just going to see more of that in the years ahead. So what I hope we can all leave here tonight doing is agreeing to push for the necessary changes in our communities that we need for this plan to be successful and with some urgency. I would like to see us making use of the assistance that Dr. Cog will be providing so that we can work with our communities to create the policy changes that will help this plan be successful. This is an action plan, so it will require action from all of us to get th to these goals. And I look forward to seeing what we all come up with in the years ahead. Thank you. Director Dyack. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I do appreciate everybody's comments, uh, Director Baker. I mean, I think um, um, I've, I, I hang around people who, um, who've had those those questions um, um, months ago, uh, gone through this process, and um, you know it's it's one of those things where, um, uh, to Director Stoltzman's point, um, that those questions are more focused on the rule which is in place, and this is a mitigation uh, measure which uh, we can put in place to monitor and to try to see if our our thoughts, our changes, our modeling um, is, is moving the needle or has moved the needle. Uh, we're at the beginning of a process. Um, I, I know uh, in the room we're not 100% aligned on a lot of things that, uh, that have been spoken here. Uh, but one thing is uh, for certain that if we do not uh, come up with a mitigation plan, uh, other people will be telling us how to use our money. And um, ever since I've been here um, talking to everybody else, um, I believe that the use of money is best, um, is best talked about and discussed at a more local level. Uh, we're about to hear uh, in the future, in the future agenda item, um, how we all at more local levels sit around the table and talk about what monies we have allocated based on population or something we all agreed upon to, again, um, put to use to better, to enhance, and to uh, ultimately um, uh, improve on measures such as those in the mitigation plan or those that would move the needle on the mitigation plan. So um, we're talking about the tool, the tools of mitigation plan. Um, the rule is the rule, and that's where I think a lot of those questions uh, should have been placed. Um, I think there's some unresolved questions, and uh, some of us just agree to disagree. And we have to move forward with this, this, this tool. And to me, this, this tool is the beginning of a process, and I think um, everyone should support this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, let me call for the vote. Uh, let's do it by voice vote. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. Is only one person? No. You'll, I'm sorry. If you, if you voted no, please, uh, raise your hand so we can record that. <laughs> <laughs> and a roll call vote. Okay, thank you. We will, we will note uh, Director Lance, Director Teal. Were there any other no votes? Thank you. The motion is uh, passed and the uh, RTP for 2050 Metro Vision is adopted. Thank you all. I just want to take a moment uh, of Chair's personal uh, privilege and say welcome to Director Coombs. I have to tell you that that is the cutest <laughs> baby out, outside of my own eight grandchildren that I have ever seen. Like what, a, what a cutie. Thank you. Thank you for bringing him. <laughs> That's the first of the new million. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is number nine, discussion of the uh, 22 to 25 tip subregional share call to recommendations. Todd and Alvin are going to do this.
Uh, while we are figuring out the screen here, I, I just wanted to take a moment and sort of explain how this action item relates to the next agenda item, which is also an action item. Um, so this item pertains to the call to recommendations. Uh, so this is very similar to, all right, uh, very similar to the uh, the action item that you took earlier earlier this year on the call one projects. Um, I will say that this is a recommendation to um, approve these call two projects. However, it will not actually place them in the tip, and that's where we get to the next agenda item, where we will go through what we're calling a special policy amendment to actually place them within the tip. And Josh will go through that next. All right, so first I just wanted to uh, have a little bit of background so everyone is aware of exactly where we are in our very long four call tip process to program uh, approximately $450 million. Um, we are doing this over two tip cycles. So calls one and two are, are to program the current 22 to 25 tip. As we move further into calls three and four, uh, we will program a brand new tip covering federal fiscal years 24 to 27. Um, as I stated earlier this year in May, um, there was the regional call one uh, that we worked through to recommend projects. What I bring to you tonight is, is the results of all the forums working together and making recommendations on call two for $173 million. Um, not to stop anywhere along this process, uh, we are already um, a few weeks out from the closing of call number three. And of course, we will continue this process as we go into call four a sub-regional share uh, process that will open up uh, right after Thanksgiving. So a little bit more detail about the projects that we're asking for your recommendation tonight. So this call for projects was open from uh, May 2nd to June 24th. Again, this was solely for air quality and multimodal applications only. So these projects must improve air quality and or congestion. Um, these applications were submitted directly from the project sponsors themselves to each forum. And then each technical committee and or forum went through the process to score, deliberate, and then finally recommend projects within their funding target. Um, so the table that you see on your screen and, and within your packet um, outlines the results of this call. Uh, for the eight subregions, there was a total of 59 projects that were submitted for $186 million. Um, the funding target that was provided to each individual forum totaled $173 million. And through those deliberations from um, each forum, they're recommend, they are recommending 50 total projects for $166 million. Now, there's a couple things um, that I certainly would like to point out. Um, as you know, the funding recommendation of $166 million is less than the funding target. Uh, so this did leave essentially $6.8 million on the table, if you want to call it, call it for that. However, that $6.8 million will be rolled into a new total for these calls three and four. Call three, again, is ongoing. Um, once we have a new updated total uh, for calls three and four, again, 20% of those funds will go towards the regional share, which is call three. 80% will go towards the call, uh, call number four. There is also highlighted uh, an asterisk next to the Arapahoe County recommended funding. Um, their total amount is higher than their funding target, and I'll go through that uh, recommendation here on the next slide. So for a little bit of detail, the funding recommendations for, uh, from the Arapahoe County Forum. Um, their recommendation did exceed their target by $992,000. Um, within the Adams target, uh, because they are affected by um, this recommendation from Arapahoe, when we looked at all of their total submitted projects and their recommendation, they were under their target by $6.4 million. So a little bit of background about the actual Bennett, uh, town of Bennett submittals, which were uh, affected and made all of this uh, in motion. The town of Bennett submitted three TIP applications. Two of, the, two of them were within the Adams County Forum and one within Arapahoe. When we put all three of these projects together, they, did com they would complete one large trail going from the town of Bennett south to uh, I-70. Within the Arapahoe County Forum, um, this project that was submitted within the Arapahoe Forum was their lowest scoring forum, and they were only able to recommend $394,000 of the $1.386 million request 
from that application. Um, so at that time, Dr. Cog's staff did contact both technical members from the Adams and Arapahoe forums, along with staff from Bennett, um, and did have some discussions. And ultimately, through those discussions, um, the Arapahoe for forum put forth a recommendation um, that would recommend allocating $992,000 of the remaining Adams forum target to fund the remaining balance of the Bennett project that was submitted through the Arapahoe forum. So ultimately, the Arapahoe County Bennett project that was submitted for their $1.386 million request, $394,000 million, $394, would be funded through the Arapahoe uh, funding target, and $992,000 would come from the remaining balance of the Adams target. So a little bit about the public process, uh, public comment process that staff undertook. Um, this was a continuation of a process that we began um, coming up, uh, passed in um, tip call number one. Uh, we held a 20-day public comment period for the public, um, in addition to the normal public ways that they were able to comment through email or phone or e-blast, uh, they were also able to use a web map. Through that web map, they were able to comment directly on projects and indicate whether they had support, concern, or were opposed to the individual project. Um, overall, 165 projects were submitted, and of course, each forum was able to use those comments in their deliberations. So I just wanted to take a second before we get to the next steps in the action to really go through and look at not only these call two projects, but also take a look at what your recommendations in call one also funded. So in total from these two calls, 56 total awards, 36 intersections will be approved, um, 60 miles of bike ped facilities will be, built, will be built, 13 studies, three quarters of the projects will implement complete streets, and 82% will improve connections to transit. 29 unique project eight sponsor agencies across all eight counties were included, and almost three, three quarters of these projects are in or near urban centers or on the Dr. Cog high injury network. In terms of potential crash reductions, um, 21 fewer fatal crashes and 135 fewer serious injury crashes are projected through the application with the funding of these projects. And of course, overall within the Dr. Cog population, one third of the population within the region would be affected by these projects. So the proposed motion here is on your screen, uh, move to approve the sub-regional share projects to be included within the current 22 to 25 tip. Um, and just to go through some next steps real quick, um, based on your approval tonight um, and the approval to place them in the TIP on the next agenda item, um, we will begin to send out award and notification email to you later this week, um, where each project sponsor can begin that IGA, pro IGA development process um, with CDOT. And as I mentioned earlier, call three is ongoing, another regional share call um, covering funding from 24 to 27. And then as we get to after Thanksgiving, we will go ahead and open up another call for the sub-regional share. It'll be approximately 11 months from now when we get to the adoption and the end of this process with the adoption of the 24 to 27 tip. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Todd. Uh, before we begin with comments and questions, I'd like to solicit a motion to put the motion on the floor and second it so that we can have appropriate discussion. Director Starker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move to approve the sub-regional share projects to be included in the current uh, fiscal year 2022-5 tip. Thank you. And uh, Director Shaw uh, uh, seconded. Second. Thank you. Uh, uh, the chair would like to note, uh, just make special note, uh, as we did at RTC yesterday, about the collaboration between Arapahoe and Adams County on that Bennett project and uh, thank Arapo County for not living in a silo and and collaborating across the county. Because like the town of Bennett, you know, it's right there's Arapo, right there's Adams, and there's, this is just a great, in my view, a great illustration of Thanks. how sub, the sub-regional process doesn't preclude collaboration. So thank you, Director Holden. That's, that's a very important point, and I, I uh, you know, appreciate the comments. I think that... Uh, as we look at, at the 
at this last year, we've been pretty blessed by having additional funding. And I think as we move further into the future, we're going to have to look at at more efforts to really collaborate on these projects, get them done, and, and provide a, a strong uh, matrix by which we make those decisions. We all can agree on question or whatever mandates um, we're looking for to, not to forget about those gases uh, in these. Thank you. Thank you. And Todd, correct me. If I'm wrong, but otherwise, without that, nine hundred ninety-two thousand dollars would have rolled over into halls three and four. That is correct. And the Bennett project was sat there under underfunded. So, thank you. Was there a hand, down there? Director Whitlow? How you do this? Thing? Um, thank you very much for the time. I just wanted to uh, have a great shout out to Todd and Jacob and his teams. I was the chair for the. Southwest Weld Forum, and it takes a lot of effort. And our teams come together on multiple multiple calls. So I just want to say, Todd, thank you for your time, not only for our forum, for all forums during these calls, because they take a lot of time and effort and collaboration with not only with um, Dr. Cog, but with our staff. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Director Dyack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, pile on as well. Um, I would I greatly appreciate uh, staff's uh, ability to score our projects, uh, having an unbiased uh, eye towards all these projects, um, allowed our, our uh, technical working group to really look and uh, put our biases aside and um, really sit down and um, kind, of, kind of look figure out what was important. Um, you know, I, I don't want to go over our project list again, but it was great to see everybody who submitted a project uh, be able to, uh, to secure funding so they could, uh, they could work on their own part of Metro Vision. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I have one, Ms. Sally. Oh, Director Daigle. I'll just pile on, too. I co-chaired with Commissioner Baker and um, I, I don't know how how we did it before this. I mean, <laughs> this is just such a really awesome way to get things done and get the money, you know, where it needs to go and the, the funding to, to the folks that need it, like Bennett and what have you. I mean, how did we do it before then? Because I don't remember, because this is really... Yes, that's how we did it. Yeah. Okay. This is really an awesome process, and the people behind the scenes are so, so extraordinary. Um, I just shout out to all of them. So, thank you. Brian, I, I, wherever he is. Thank you. I was actually thinking of pro wrestling. Oh, that was that was part of it too. I do remember. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Seeing none, let me call for the vote. All those in favor of the motion to um, uh, approve the sub-regional share projects to be included in the 22-25 TIP. I'm looking at the wrong one. That's the next one. On the wrong page. Uh, yes, sorry. I shouldn't have taken that. that. That was my fault. I was jumping the gun. All those in favor of that motion that was up there before, <laughs> please signify by saying aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Hearing no opposed, are there any abstentions? Hearing none, it is unanimously approved. Thank you very much, Todd. Uh, next up, item 10, discussion of the fiscal year 22-25 TIP special policy amendments. Gosh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as Todd laid out, uh, the previous action that you just took was to approve awarding funds uh, to the call to projects. We do, uh, just as part of the process, need a separate action to then take those awarded funds and amend those into the TIP. Um, so this uh, proposed policy amendment would make those changes for both the Call 2 sub-regional share projects, which you just voted on, as well as the Call 1 regional share projects, which the board took action on at their May meeting. Um, because some projects did receive funding through both the regional and sub-regional shares, and some projects did receive funding through multiple uh, subregions. There are a total of 50 unique <coughs> project changes being made to the TIP. 
These account for $206,549,000. Um, in most of these cases, these are new projects being added to the TIP, although in a couple cases, this is additional scope and additional funding being added to existing projects, in which case uh, the TIP ID of those existing projects is noted in your memo. Um, happy to take any questions on any of these. I won't run through all 50 of them for you, uh, but I do have a motion available for you in your packet and on your screen. Thank you. The motion is on the screen. Would anyone like to offer that motion and then we can have discussion on it? Uh, Director Pulaski. Would you want me to read it? Uh, Move to adopt a resolution by 20- S-25 transportation projects selected for funding calls projects calls number one and number two. Thank you. Second. Read that over there. Steve? Director Rodericio. All right. Uh, discussion? Questions? I think the chair would point out that since we just approved a motion uh, approving the recommended uh, projects, it would be rather inconsistent not have a unanimous vote on this? Are there any questions or comments? All right, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the uh, motion is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you to staff. Uh, next up, informational briefings, uh, Dr. Cog's Area Agency on Aging, aging New Visual Identity. Steve. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Erickson. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director at Dr. <clears throat> Cog. And I, I first want to say just how great it is to see all of you in person. I, I really think it's wonderful to be back together. So. Uh, thank you, Chair Flynn. And I'm here tonight to uh, talk about a new visual identity, which really means new logo that we've created for the area agency on aging. So uh, just to quickly go through uh, the agenda, I'll, I'll kind of give a brief overview of how we approach uh, visual identity here at Dr. Cog. Talk about why we decided, it's been about a year ago that we started talking about creating a new visual identity for our area agency on aging. So I wanna talk about why we decided to do that. Give you a bit of an overview of the process, uh, talk about the criteria uh, and some of the things we considered in terms of the design and then reveal the new logo, which if you've looked through your packets, you've already seen it. So if it's anticlimactic, please clap anyways. I don't, I don't know. So. <laughs> Um, and it, well, thank you. Yeah, a, a pre-clap. Anyway, so uh, most of you are familiar with that logo sort of top, front, and center. That is our primary Dr. Cog logo. We actually rebranded, I think, in my second year here at Dr. Cog. So this is now eight years ago that we, we rebranded with this logo. And I won't go into a lot of the details on that, but just one of the things to be aware of. And at some point, I'll, I'll share sort of the brand story with the Dr. Cog logo. But You'll notice sort of the lowercase font, lowercase fonts are considered sort of more friendly and approachable, and uh, there's, there's some thought into the, um, uh, the color palette there. So that's our primary logo, and sometimes you see it with uh, the tag on the top, we make life better, uh, and sometimes you see it without. Uh, if you look down to the right, then at the same time that we rebranded, we actually did create logos for our separate divisions. So you'll see a logo there where in place of we make life better, it says area agency on aging. So actually each division here at, at Dr. Gog does have a logo uh, like that. Um, we stay pretty true uh, to that logo. There are some exceptions to that, that we do have some sub brands and the most um, prominent one, and, and this is to me the most prominent one because I oversee the way to go program here at Dr. Cog. Um, the reason we created a sub-brand for the Way to Go program is really twofold. Um, number one, that program is very public-facing. We deal a lot with uh, the general public when we're organizing large events like Bike to Work Day. 
Uh, anyway, so it, it speaks to the need for its own visual identity. The other really important thing with Way to Go is um, many of you know that's a partnership. So that is not just Dr. Cog, it's actually Dr. Cog and uh, eight transportation management associations now. So sometimes, like if you see a bike to work day poster, we'll lock that Way to Go logo up right next to the Dr. Cog logo, and it all just looks great together. So. So why start thinking about a new visual identity for uh, the area agency on aging? And the short answer really is, um, it's my job, it's our job to communicate well with all of our different audiences. And so what we knew from some experience is that a lot of our audiences connect more closely to the area agency on aging, identify with that versus Denver Regional Council of Governments. And so it's a mouthful to say Denver Regional Council of Governments Area Agency on Aging. So we wanted something that would be kind of a, a quick get. Uh, part of the impetus for this actually came out of recruiting. Like many organizations, Dr. Cog has sort of been challenged with uh, finding and keeping good, uh, good staff, and particularly in recruiting situations, Think of, uh, let's say, a social worker, professional, who is scanning job opportunities, and they say, see Denver Regional Council of Governments is looking for a case manager. They, we may have lost them at council or of or governments. Um, think of that now if it says the area agency on aging is looking for a case manager. There's a more immediate connection, so that was really part of it. Uh, similarly, a lot of our clients, uh, you know, those members of the public that we serve uh, and our stakeholders in the region, again, more closely identify with our area agency on aging. One of the things, too, in, in terms of, uh, I mentioned this related to Way to Go, but obviously, and you'll hear from Jayla here in just a minute, but these guys, they, they are our heroes, right? Uh, the angels in our area agency on aging serving the public across the region. So, um, this, since I've been here, has become the largest public-facing entity working directly with the public here at Dr. Cog. A lot of the work we do obviously happens behind the scenes, and it's really good work and it's really important work, um, but there's maybe not the need for that unique visual identity. The other thing that, that sort of went into this process, less about the impetus, but, but this agency has been evolving. So many of you probably know that not only do we serve older adults, uh, in the region, but we have a veterans program and we had an accountable health communities program. So it's really changed an awful lot just in the last five or 10 years. So in terms of the process, um, when I was in the private sector, I did a fair amount of branding work and we just started with the basics, uh, you know, identifying your audience and, you know, really um, trying to define brand traits and personality. Who are we? We are trustworthy and we are friendly and approachable. Um, and, and here to help. And so starting with that, uh, we sort of formed a, a small working group, uh, I would say initially within my division, but then pulled in a bunch of stakeholders from Jayla's division um, and worked uh, over the course of almost a year to develop this new brand identity, this new visual identity. We did talk about um, something that would have been a bit more radical, um, and that would have been perhaps a name change. Um, some of you are aware that there are 16 area agencies on aging in the state. Uh, we are the largest and the best of those area agencies on aging. Uh, one of our um, um, uh, folks to the west, one of the uh, agencies to the west of us rebranded with, uh, what was the name, Jayla? It's, that's right, Vintage. So. Think about that in terms of an immediate get. So if you see vintage, um, do you immediately understand what, what it is that they're um, about? Uh, and we, we did talk about, so that would be an example if you see here of an abstract name. Uh, we tend to, to, to lean more towards something that is descriptive. Again, we want that to be an easy get for folks. So the closest thing we have to an abstract name here at Dr. Cog would be way to go for, for those that have really been around a long time, uh, when I started, Way to Go was known as Rider Rangers. And so that's a descriptive name, um, but it's kind of an, it was even at the time an inaccurate descriptive name because we did a lot more than arrange rides. As you know, Way to Go promotes uh, all forms of um, 
uh, commute options other than driving alone. So we, we promote transit and we promote walking and biking and, and even telework. So we had all of those discussions. Uh, and then some of the other considerations that went into this. Um, it took me about a year, maybe after I started at Dr. Cog, to get it in my <coughs> head. You know, I'd create something uh, for Jayla's team, and she said, would say, that font needs to be much bigger than that. We're talking about people with older eyes who may not be able to read that. Read, read that. So I uh, definitely considered accessibility in terms of this design. Uh, and again, we were really trying to kind of thread the needle. I mean, one of my key responsibilities at Dr. Cog is to build our brand, uh, the brand of this organization. But at the same time, I'm also hoping to ensure or help with the success of our individual uh, programs. And so kind of just trying to thread the needle in terms of how we approached that. Um, and I should have done like the drum roll thing, but I, I didn't. But here's, here it is, um, you know, the, the, the new logo uh, and the new visual identity. Oh gosh, I'm getting an echo up here now. I don't know what's happening, but I'm gonna keep going. Okay. All right. So what stands out? Um, aging, of course. Uh, big and bold. Okay. Um, and again, we, as as I said, we stayed pretty uh, true to that name. I mean, that name is actually a federal designation, right? We are an area agency on aging. Um, so we did keep that in, in, in the name and in this visual identity. Now the plus sign to the right is sort of our nod to kind of the expanding work that we're doing in the area agency on aging. Um, you know, really, uh, it, it not only sets us up for success today, but it sets us up for success in the future. You'll hear from Jayla and maybe have in the past about all of the work that they're considering. This agency, like many others, needs to evolve in order to thrive. So um, out of this, too, oh, one of the questions I, I guess I get uh, uh, sometimes on this, and we took this to ACA, the Advisory Committee on Aging, a couple of months ago and, and had really, really good response to it. But people did ask about uh, that color scheme, right, this color palette. Those two colors, sort of that dark blue and teal, and it doesn't really reproduce well as well on this screen, are actually secondary color palettes colors that, that fit with what you, you don't get royalties. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> All for you. All for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so uh, those are secondary colors. I'll show you here in a second sort of how that looks with our, um, with our other uh, color palette. But uh, through this process and working with Jayla's team, one of the things they asked as well as, you know, could we have something succinct to sort of describe, um, you know, it, it isn't just about service, it's not just about support, um, and advocacy sometimes sort of gets lost in the shuffle, but they do all, all three of these things really, really well. So you sort of see the tag uh, to the bottom there noting that, and this might be one of those things in, in certain instances, particularly in a smaller presentation, we, we may drop that because it'll be too hard to read. So now you see sort of the family of, of, of logos with uh, the Dr. Cog Area Agency on aging. I will mention in terms of narrative, we are not going to, um, if we're saying, you know, something just written in an article or whatever, it will not be referencing the Area Agency on Aging Plus. I mean, that really is just for the logo for the visual identity. But you'll see that then sometimes locked up again with the main Dr. Cog logo, just as you would uh, for way to go. We also, as part of this process, uh, created uh, some logos that uh, sort of represent some of the initiatives or programs within the Area Agency on Aging. So this is just an example of one uh, for our ombudsman program. And that's really it. I'm happy to, to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, observations? Uh, Steve, I would like to, um, I don't think I want to hear any of the abstract candidates, but as a person of vintage, <laughs> I, I want to say that I'm very happy that we stayed with the, with the more specific uh, area agency on aging because I still, I still say Bonfice Blood Center rather than Vitalant. Uh, I'm not quite sure what Vitalant tells me it is, but I know what Bonfice Blood Center was. So I'm, I'm personally, I am very happy that we stayed with that name. Uh, do any other directors have comments, questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. 
Next, we have Jayla, uh, item 12 on the agenda update on the Area Agency on Aging. So I know, put aging at the end of the agenda. That's a terrible thing because uh, you all want to go home, I know, and some people are like, I don't want to talk about aging, geez. Um, so I'm going to, and my boss over there is going to be like giving me the nod if I go on too much, but I don't get to talk to you often. So I really do want to make this as valuable as I, as I can. Um, I'm really happy about the change because uh, of the logo, because when you say, so this is, I'm Jayla Sanchez Warren. I'm the director of the area agency on aging at the Denver regional council of governments. Half of my audience is asleep by the time I get done with that. Right. And so, um, I'm real happy about, about the change. Um, I think it's really important that we keep the area agency on aging, but we do do more. Um, so let's see if I can get that. Good. So because some of you are new and some of you might need a little refresher, Denver Regional Council of Governments has been the area agency on aging since 1974. A couple years, Steve Erickson, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. That has to be a big party and a lot of press around that. Um, we serve an eight-county region. So we serve the city and county of Broomfield, city and county of Denver, Adams, Arapaho, Clear Creek, Douglas, Gilpin, and Jefferson County. Boulder has its own area agency on aging. Okay, this is something you all need to think about. And remember, Colorado has the second fastest aging population in the United States. The second fastest aging population. So what does that mean, right? We're growing older and we're growing older fast. We have about, not that we're, no, I know, it's confusing, sorry. We're, it's changing fast. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of boomers move into Colorado in the 70s and they stayed and they are aging, right? Um, and so uh, that's why Florida has already aged, Arizona has already aged. We're that population is our fastest growing population. 74 to 79 is the fastest demographic change. The 90 plus is the second fastest aging cohort group in Colorado. The 90 plus. Are you thinking about those people when you do your plans? Are you thinking what that looks like when you develop your parks or your intersections? Those are things that we need to think about. We have five, we have about five. 116,000 older adults in Colorado, and we have 49% of those here in the metropolitan area. And they keep on moving here um, because there are services here. We have 19 hospitals in the region. Um, we have all sorts of services here that other parts of our rural or, or, or Colorado and our rural areas don't. But we get our authority under the Older Americans Act. The Older Americans Act says, um, we're gonna give you this money and we get money from the, the state too. Serve all people over 60. If you can't serve all people over 60, you must target your services. So we can't serve all people over 60 in everything that we do, so we target our services the way the Older Americans Act tells us to, 75 and older, those who have lower income, those that are socially isolated, homebound in particular, have a hard time getting out more geographically isolated, so rural areas, and then the, um, a focus on minority low-income folks as well. We do a couple of things. So in order to serve these folks, the Older Americans Act gives us lots of categories of service that we have to, that we have to provide. We do that in two ways. We do direct service and we do contracted service. I'm just going to highlight some of the, cat the categories and tell you how we do that. I'm not going to go over each, um, but for transportation, transportation like uh, is a big deal for older adults. Think about a time that you may not be able to drive. You can't drive anymore. I'm taking away the keys. You don't have a car. How do you get to where you need to go and to where you want to go? How does that change your life? Those are really important things. 
our population is growing older and it will continue to grow older. Transportation is a massive issue now. It's going to get, become even a bigger issue as we move into 2050. How do I help you get to where you want to go when you need to get there? How do I help you go see friends and family? How do you get your hair done, ladies? And don't underestimate the value of a good hair day because I'm grumpy when my hair looks bad. <laughs> right? These are all things. How do you engage in life? Do you only want to go to the doctor and to meal programs? Or do you want to do other things when you're older? How do you do that when you can't drive? We're funding 13 different transportation companies right now. And it's not enough. Nutrition is our second biggest program. Um, we provide, we fund about 5,500 Meals on Wheels congregate meals every single day. Um, we, we do that through our partners, Volunteers of America, Project Angel. Personal care and in-home services. These are, this is 12 um, uh, service providers in the area. They do things like helping with home modifications, helping with yard work, helping. So many of you have beautification codes in your, in your communities, right? And if people don't keep their weeds and their lawns trimmed, you will cite them. What do you do with someone who's 84 and her husband is 90 and has Alzheimer's and she can't do that anymore? You call the Area Agency on Aging. That's what you do when you have that client because we can help them through our programs. They also are um, programs that help in uh, meal preparation, grocery shopping, things like that. Counseling, this is counseling, mental health counseling, uh, counseling uh, for people who are newly blind and, and visually impaired, um, counseling for folks that are homeless, and there is a growing aging homeless population that has a new and different challenges than a, a traditional um, population. They can't keep up with the rent. If, if you see rent increases of $400, they can't pay that. They're on fixed incomes. So where do they go? And oftentimes it's very dangerous for older adults to go into shelters because they are victimized in those shelters. We have education providers, visual impairment services, hearing aids, and eyeglasses. This is a place, you know how much hearing aids cost? $6,000, four to $6,000. That's expensive if you can't pay and you're on a fixed income, right? Eyeglasses. So this is a provider that you guys can call. You can call our office. We'll connect you to them. Legal service providers. Um, Evidence-based uh, uh, disease prevention and, and health promotion, fall prevention. We have the largest fall prevention program in the United States for older adults. 15,000 people signed up to our um, mobile app called Nimble, which help people um, with their balance and it's, present, it, it's preventing, it's evidence-based, it is preventing falls every single day, which is so exciting. Case management services, emergency assistance. This is a lot about food and shelter. Screening, all sorts of screening, mental health screening, um, uh, vision screening, screening for um, uh, communicable diseases, things like that. So that's our contracted service providers, over 40 contracted service providers providing all those services to older adults in your community. 
internal, we have 12 internal programs. I'm not going to talk about them all. I'm going to talk about a couple. The Ombudsman Program, this is a program that protects the rights of people living in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. There are over 500 facilities in our region, guys. Over 27,000 people living in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. They are the people that are not remembered and they have real significant issues. If you have a constituent that has a complaint, which we get regularly from, from you all, has concerns about a nursing home, Mr. Chair, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, you can refer them here. We will help them. If you have someone that's going into a nursing home or assisted living, they're not all created equal. Please give us a call. The other is that I want to highlight is the state health insurance program, the SHIP program. This is Medicare, all things benefits, but primarily Medicare um, and uh, open enrollment is coming up in October. So remember, Medicare, anyone turning 65, guys, you need to get on this three months before you turn 65. And then remember, if you want to change programs, open enrollment is the time to do that. Um, so there are challenges that we're dealing with. Kind of the first is COVID. The number one risk factor for COVID has always been since the beginning, being over 60. It, we lost about, I can't really tell for sure, but about 318 of our clients during COVID. Um, it is still plaguing us. We have 90 nursing home right, right now with active outbreaks of COVID. We have service stops and starts. So we'll open up a congregate meal site in your community and somebody gets COVID and we have to shut it down. Two weeks. And then we open it back up and then somebody else has COVID in another service and then they have to shut it down per the health department in their community. Now that's changing a little bit, but still because older adults are the most vulnerable and, and then older adults who are have comorbidities, as they call, right, health issues, um, are even more um, vulnerable. We have to be really careful. The demand for PPE is really high, the, the personal protective equipment. You need a mask when you come to Dr. Cog, come to aging, because I got tons of them. Um, <laughs> you need any kind of PPE while you're here, I got it, because uh, my staff have to take it out, right? Um, we go through a lot of PPE. Uh, dealing with COVID-19 among uh, staff, uh, our staff, as well as the staff that serve older adults in our community. Uh, recently, I think I had five different staff that were out. That puts it, uh, you know, that impacts the workload, um, especially for people on INA. So I have people coming in, people going out. You can't go out and visit nursing homes if you have COVID. We have to stay. There's all sorts of rules and regulations that we have to think of. It's still a big part of our life. COVID-19 is, is still a big part of our life. Concerns over turnover and wages. All of our community service providers have really, many of them lost staff, had to reduce staff because the older adults were staying in, right? The governor said, stay home, shelter in place, don't go out. And so all the service providers said, wait a second, I, but they're not going to the doctor and they're not going to the meal sites and we're not transporting them. So had, they had to lay off staff. Now they're having a hard time getting that staff coming back on and the wages they're asking for. Holy gamoly. I can testify. I had about half of my staff turn over during COVID. It was a stressful, terrible time in the area agency on aging and people got burned out and they left. Several of them left the whole field. Um, and now as we rehire, you would not believe what these people want and are getting in other sec or, you know, other places. It's crazy. So all of our service providers, our transportation providers, they were paying $15 an hour to their drivers before COVID. Now it's 2150 and they still can't get people to be high, get all, all the people they need, right? 
via mobility is continually struggling to hire. Everybody is. It's really difficult. Um, and then the impact of long COVID. Long COVID is real. That is when you still, you had COVID and now you're still having the impact of COVID and we're seeing it in older adults in lung capacity and heart issues and cognitive issues. We've seen an increase of, of dementia. Um, these things are very real and they're taking more resources and more time. We have challenges in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Remember over 500 of those facilities in our area. We are seeing a lot of discharge and evictions. We saw it all the way through COVID. Unfortunately, we saw facilities discharge residents to make room for um, COVID units because Medicare reimburses higher for COVID than they do for others. And we were seeing a lot of involuntary discharges. We continue to see that, some because they don't have enough staff. So we're seeing people say, really good facilities, and this is a good facility. They will say, sorry, we can't take your loved one because we don't have the, enough staff to care for them. That's a good facility. Challenge is, when you need a facility, you need a facility, right? Especially a nursing home. The second issue is a lot of staff left nursing homes, and they can't get them back. They're really struggling. So the residents in there are having significant care issues, weight loss, um, medication errors, pressure sores. We're even seeing restraints, which we haven't seen in 20 years in nursing homes. So it's very concerning. Um, the, it's so important if you have someone going into a facility, call an ombudsman. Food, service quality, staffing concerns, everything that goes along with staffing, bathing, call light response, all of those things are a problem. Another thing is we have wa uh, waiting lists we're, and the waiting lists are growing. I'm not gonna go over them, but you can see that chore services, those things like house cleaning and um, yard work and those kinds of things, uh, big, big waiting lists for those because we don't have as many providers doing those. Material aid, so hearing aids, again, the docs. So we don't have a lot of doctors participating with us. We're trying to get a contract or we're just now pursuing a, um, getting information about c contracting with Costco because that c we could buy a lot more hearing aids with that program than we could um, with others. So about 1,000 or 1,100 people on a waiting list right now as of these are July numbers. Sorry, I don't have more current numbers. Um, they're on the waiting list for a, did that work? Yeah. They're on the waiting list for several days. And I need to tell you that the two last ones, transportation and in-home are, those numbers are uh, switched. It's actually seven days, 70 days for transportation, over 220 days for in-home services. This is super concerning because this is the program, in-home services. If you don't get in-home services, you have to go to a nursing home or assisted living pretty darn quickly. So that's a problem. That's a concern. We're working on that. We had three of our in-home service providers, the companies that we contracted with, quit during the pandemic, closed their doors. And so we've been struggling to, to get those, uh, those partnerships developed again. Um, and this, this is just uh, where we are um, uh, for the unable to serve. So we have to track by the state tells us in July, we were, able, we were unable to serve 888 people because they requested a service that, that they needed right away and we couldn't provide it. Another really big challenge is we are facing a big fiscal cliff. And I think you all are probably very familiar with this. Um, several of our pots of money that have been there for a while are not going to be there anymore um, come uh, 2023. The homestead funds, the American Rescue, so all of the COVID dollars um, have to be uh, spent by September 2024. Um, the, right now, the, we have to, unlike transportation, 
we can't carry over money or we can only carry over 10% of our federal dollars. We can't carry any more of that. So it goes back to the state and the state reallocates. Um, and we can't carry over one single dime in um, uh, state funds. So that's a big issue for us. They have to be spent or they go away. The problem is if our providers can't spend it, then we're really challenged to spend those dollars, right? We're predicting that we'll have a fiscal cliff of about $6.1 million. Now, I know in your world, in the world of transportation, that doesn't seem like anything. But in our world, that's huge. And what this likely means is not only will more people be on the waiting list, but there's a very big possibility that I will have to take services away from people who already have them. We will see staff reductions in our triple in our in our triple A staff. I'm going to work really, really hard. And Rich and I have plans, um, and and our lobbyists have plans to help us. Um, uh, tell this story to our legislators, and, and we're going to D.C. Um, shortly to talk to, to our federal legislators and try to get the language in the bill for, for more money, but I, I'm nervous. On the horizon, really quickly, we are in, um, every four years we have to do an area plan on aging. We are in that process right now. It includes a lot of a consumer, um, a, a community survey of older adults, um, community conversations, key informant sessions, demographic analysis, gap analysis, all sorts of things. Um, as soon as we're done with that, I will present it to you. I will be presenting it to your communities. I will be coming out to your city councils or wherever you want me to come and talk about what we know about older adults in our region. We're having an aging summit, gathering all the county councils on aging and the commissions on aging. Um, many of you have commissions on aging and coming together to talk about how it's going out there and giving them information about demographics and helping them advocate for their needs in your communities. We're getting a new data system. Hallelujah, boy, that's going to help us in so many ways. Tell the stories that we need to uh, tell. Uh, but it's painful right now. It is painful. If you all know, if you've gone to a new data system, it is not fun. Um, <laughs> uh, partnership development, we our older population is going to grow by 63% between now and 2050. I guarantee you, unless there's a miracle, our federal and state funds won't keep pace with that, right? We have got to develop different partnerships if we want to continue to provide these important community services to our older adults. Guys, I'm not talking just about the older people that are there now. I'm talking about us in 15 years, in 20 years. That's us. We're going to be needing these services. I have got to develop, we have got to develop partnerships with hospitals and insurance companies in order uh, to keep pace with the growth and the needs of our older adults in our community. So we're working with lots of different programs and we we're trying really hard. We'll see how that works out. There's all sorts of incentives at the federal level. The federal level is saying, hey, you hospitals need to provide, partner with community-based services. They're talking about adding community-based services into Medicare. We'll see how all that plays out. Right now, it's all in the talking stage and not really in the implementation phase. I don't see that as being a, 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 an answer to the, to the problems in 2024 but maybe by 2030 we'll be there. Um, a lot of education and advocacy is going on. Um, we will be telling our stories. We will be giving data. In my mind, it's hearts and minds. We have a lot of data to share with our legislators, with our leaders, um, and we also have stories of real life people every single day that our services are making a difference in their lives. And so we will be sharing those stories and giving that data to anyone who will listen, and hopefully they will um, want to, to contribute um, in some way to helping older adults um, in our state and in our region in particular. That is my presentation. I think I did pretty good, Doug. <laughs> Everybody who knows knows me, I could talk for hours and hours about aging. So, 
Well, Stop you came very close. nervous when I'm last on the agenda. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Jayla. Uh, her reference, her reference to the chair earlier, uh, is a, a st just a brief, you know, ten-second story. Here is I got a call from a constituent yesterday who had a neighbor, a 91-year-old neighbor, who was in a rehab facility after hospitalization and whose home on her on the neighbor's block might have been sold out from under her, and she had nowhere to go. Uh, she had no viable discharge plan. And so I get this text from a constituent, what do I do? How can I help this person? And so I emailed Jayla and Doug, and within an hour, I was able to connect this neighbor with a resource that uh, I don't know the outcome yet because the neighbor's going to call me to tell me how it turned out. But I was in a panic. How do I help this 91-year-old woman find a place to to go to after discharge. So I know the value of, of the area agency on aging. I hope that none of us has to use it the way I did, but you may have to. Uh, had to go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I just got a little sensitive to pronouns at one of your statements, so that's my really bad joke. Um, but I wanted to say that when you said about the shortfall, you said in your world, in transportation, it's a lot. It's not a lot of money, but in our world, it is a lot. And I just want you to know, your world is our Thank you. world. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for Jayla? Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the the informational item. One administrative modification to the 2225 TIP it involves, I think, a bridge replacement in need, if I read that correctly. Uh, next item, committee reports, uh, report from the stack. Uh, Nick, uh, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stack men on September 1st, while there were no official action items, number of important topics were discussed. Uh, staff provided an update on the 10-year plan ahead of its September 15th approval at the Transportation Commission. Sorry, Rebecca, if I ruined your, your big update there, that it did pass on September 15th. Highlights uh, include uh, uh, increase in transit. So similar to kind of what we just went through, the plan both uh, kind of coupled uh, updates to the plan to get the correspondence with the uh, greenhouse gas plan. Plan up, uh, lays out complete delivery of the first four years of projects, so that's 19 through 22 builds a priority list for the next four years, 23 through 26, and plans for the final years of the plan, 27 and beyond. From there, we transition into a discussion of CDOT's compliance strategy to meet greenhouse gas pollution standards as it relates to the 10-year plan. So again, very similar, and you know, the, the collaboration was evident on there, um, utilizing mitigation measure, measures to get across the finish line, TDM, heavy-duty vehicles, uh, increased investment in transit. Do want to call out uh, a $100 million increase in bus rapid transit, uh, operational efficiencies, built environment, and also a change in approach towards central I-25 on there. With proposed updates to the plan, CDOT's going to meet the greenhouse gas reductions in the 2025 and 2030 target years, and then 2040 and 50 target years are met through scenario planning. And finally, CDOT uh, provided a briefing on wildlife infrastructure investments. Very interesting. That concludes my update. Thank you, Nick. Uh, next up, Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Mayor Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The caucus met on uh, August the 3rd. We had a presentation on the Building for Economic and Environmental Resiliency with uh, builders Gene Meyer with Thrive Builders, Carl Koble with Koble and & Company, and David Ware with McStain Neighborhoods talking about how they, um, how they deliver product into the market and how that might be made more affordable. Uh, we also had an emergency management uh, discussion and takeaways from the Marshall Fire. We were pleased to have uh, Representative Joe Neguse with us. Uh, Kevin Klein with the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management in Colorado, uh, Michael Conway, the, the uh, Commissioner of Insurance, and uh, Mayor Clint Folsom with the Town of Superior to talk about uh, some of the takeaways and what we might, how we might look, uh, look into the future with uh, making our communities more resilient disasters. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, Com uh, Commissioner Baker is not here tonight. Is there another member who wants to make a report? Yes. Thank you. Let me know that he was sick. So. Thank you. I'll make a, uh, a brief report sure. now. 
this is without having actually been there. That was covered by my colleague. However, um, uh, uh, wildfire mitigation plans were discussed, uh, including a presentation of the uh, Douglas County wildfire mitigation plan, including our um, underway plan for a um, $13 million shaded fuel break project along the base of the pike, as well as I believe we had other updates from uh, other uh, counties on their uh, wildfire mitigation planning. Thank you, uh, Director Teal. Report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla. Had an update um, on the Ombudsman program, just kind of really helping them understand the challenges that, that I gave you some information about. Um, they had a presentation by um, our SHIP program, which you now know is our Medicaid program, um, uh, uh, talking about open enrollment and how we were going to address that. And then the Senior Medicare Patrol. You know all of those commercials that are on right now over and over and over, and you see J.J. Walker going, and if you want money, um, <laughs> those calls, many of those calls come to our, our ship office, right? And so the phones are ringing <coughs> off the hook during that time, and we're helping people navigate their uh, – there's only uh, over 32 different Medicare uh, programs in the state of Colorado that you can choose from. So it's – uh, really important to get the right one. And then we talked about the regional summit uh, on aging where our uh, county councils and our county com our, our commissions on aging are going to come together and, and talk about aging in the region. Thank you, Jayla. Next up, Regional Air Quality Council, Director Rex. Chairman, thank Director. you, sir, very much. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things. We did review the 2021 audited uh, financial statements. Um, and we did approve the uh, ozone SIP, State Implementation Plan Executive Summary, which was forwarded to the Air Quality Control Commission, and Executive Director Mike Silverstein provided testimony at the uh, AQCC last week, and um, a request was made for a public hearing uh, for, for the SIP, and that, that, was, uh, that was approved, so that will be happening in, in December. So that's all, that's all good news. Thank you. Thank you. E-470, uh, Director Mulvey. The um, meetings for the summer didn't always sync up with Dr. Cog, so I will summarize the last several meetings. A lot of contracts were approved for um, ordinary and regular operations. There was also a contract for on-call engineering and land management and some roadway contract approvals, mostly around the interchanges. There was a most interesting approval of the mineral rights lease for about 71 acres in, in Aurora region, um, not in Aurora, but in the region there. And I'd like to report that they took tremendous care in making sure that the rights and the payments for the rights were advantageous more so than in the industry. And it's only 71 acres as well. Um, the other most interesting one was the Salesforce Consulting um, contract process, an invitation to negotiate instead of an IFB, and that was because it's important to ensure that they have the precise um, requirements met and to actually have that discussion up front rather than cost overruns on the back end. And so there was a lot of attention paid to that, both by the IT committee as well as the main board. Thank you. Thank you. CDOT, uh, Director White. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Director Williams for a great update. Uh, he uh, noted the couple important milestones we've hit at CDOT recently, which was adoption of the updated 10-year plan and our own work to meet the GHG rule, um, both which were unanimously adopted by the Commission. I'll just note then a couple other items tonight. We're very fortunate and happy to receive the largest uh, infrastructure grant that we know of from FHWA, $100 million for Floyd Hill. Very exciting, a great project kind of on the fringes of the Dr. Cog area. Uh, and I will note there's opportunities occasionally we have to make infrastructure uh, rather beautiful. I think that project may be one of them. Uh, the designs are pretty neat to turn that corner there and really repair a, a piece of, uh, of a rough in infrastructure right now. 
The other piece I'll note briefly tonight and maybe provide more of an update next month is we're starting to see some of the results from the transit agencies for the month of August when we had the zero fare for better air. As you all know, that wasn't just RTD, but we provided the legislation provided grants to transit agencies around the state. And we saw huge increases in transit ridership. Um, Durango saw an 11% increase in their transit, La Junta 31%, Bent County 10%. So it seemed to matter, um, get people back onto transit in the post-COVID period. So it'd be interesting to see the full results and maybe share some of the more of those. That's it for tonight. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. A report from RTD, Director Welch. Thank you, Chair Flynn and directors. Very quickly, we did have a successful zero fare for better air. August, everything I've heard so far from the frontline employees uh, is positive on, on the experience. I've heard a little bit about some intercept surveys from our customers and it all seems to have gone very well. I will be able to share some ridership numbers uh, later as well as a survey we're having conducted by BBC to do some uh, analytical work on how many people we think changed their mode from uh, driving a car to being on transit, which is what we wanted to see happen. Two other quick things. Denver's East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Project has made its first successful submittal into small starts. That's a big major milestone to uh, keep that project on track. And then finally, the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study continues to move forward with really good collaboration between RTD, the agencies involved, uh, BNSF, and Front Range Passenger Rail as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on any of the reports? Seeing none, a director reaction. Mr. Chairman, if I may, real quick, I just want to add on to to Brian's um, Brian's report um, that there were there was a letter that went out to mayors and and county commissioners related to their um, uh, sub regional service councils, and they're they're looking for for folks to participate on those councils. Is that correct, Brian? That is correct. Thank you. Oh, just just be on the watch out for that. Thank you. Uh, our next meeting is October 19th, uh, hopefully back in, remaining in person. Uh, that's the plan for now. Uh, are there any other matters from any member? I got one. No, and, and basically, hey, if you want to get out of the garage, I, oh. I got parking validation right here, and we're going to try to do that whole deal like we did in May to get you out of the parking garage a little quicker. So I'll be down there at the gate, too. So, <laughs> But we, parking validations, come get them from myself or Melinda. All right. Any other matters? Well, it looks like there are none. Everybody's getting up. So we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? All right. Linda, I'm going to Oh, you didn't have that. <laughs> All right. Linda has the parking validation. I didn't call on you for a second. Because you probably would have brought it. <laughs> I think that's what he's doing. He's brown. He's brown. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, I came across it as you too. Good, my friend. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Good to see you. Jeff, all right? Yeah, I don't know. He, he, he doesn't miss very many meetings. No. Um, no. I know. I know. I know. Very active. He and I formed a nonprofit called. I was doing that earlier. Loud Run Memorial Foundation. We have a tiny to put together a national memorial in the ministry. The arms of the 